a scientist, of course, has goals, but science can explore whatever comes along, whereas engineers are always trying to accomplish something. So when synthetic biology emerged as an idea, I said, hey, that's very interesting. That's quite closely related to the way I like to look at the living systems anyhow. The core of it is the ability to synthesize the DNA, the very code of life. And uh, once you can do that, you can, you can begin to make quite complex living systems. Imagine you can construct organisms just like you could construct bridges. Um, and individuals can do this. Huh. For the engineer, it's a, it's, a, it's a dream. And in fact, for a biologist, learning, learning for a biologist to learn how to, to think how, uh, as an engineer, that is, I think, is very exciting as well. The term synthetic biology could almost be calculated to elicit a strongly negative response by anyone with a belief in the beauty of naturally evolved DNA. I thought that was crazy. So my initial reaction was, this will never work, and these are a bunch of dreamers who will never get anywhere. And it was an intriguing enough approach that I went out and started talking to them. What I found out was they're already starting to get results. Ever since the Neolithic Revolution, man has influenced the development of plants and animals for his own benefit. Whether a crop was bred to bear more fruit, or cattle was raised in a certain way, by selection, our ancestors dramatically influenced evolution. The attempts to kind of control living things and to do things with living things is agriculture. That starts very early on. Um, there are some wonderful carvings of Assyrians where they're actually pollinating date palms and you see these large men with the wings in the back of them and they're doing these various things in various museums around the world you can see these. So we have very ancient evidence of that and of course all the crops that we use that descend from ancient times are, are proof of that. People in the past of course knew what they wanted and they knew how to get it. But what they did not understand was the way in which nature engineered the creatures they were dealing with every day. In order to uncover this secret, mankind did not need farmers, but science. In the 19th century, the Czech monk Gregor Mendel came up with the idea to grow peas in the backyard of his monastery. By monitoring what was inherited from one pea generation to the next, he found out that the process followed certain rules, today known as Mendel's Laws of Inheritance. The insights of Mendel, as well as Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, would then bring a dramatic change to the way life was understood in the 20th century. It seemed that the creation of synthetic life was just a few steps away. So the creation of life in, in the test tube is an ongoing theme in the history of 20th century biology. We often think when we hear it, oh, scientists are just about to do it. This is the first time it's going to happen. And in fact, it, it seems to have followed a very interesting path that as the nature of what is thought to be the essence of life has shifted, so have the claims for it being produced. One of the first waves, I would say, would be right around uh, 1900 or so, so around 1896. Uh, Jacques Lerbe is a physiologist, and he really wanted to uh, to study life by controlling life. He thought you so in a very famous experiment on uh, artificial parthenogenesis, he managed to get a sea urchin to reproduce itself uh, without having been fertilized. And just by using salt water concentrations and a little bit of, of shaking along the way. And this was seen as an unnatural kind of event and very popular, very many people were quite interested in it at the time. Um, there's a variety of other people at the time, also right around the turn of the century, who are doing many of these, um, of these sorts of investigations. There's a uh, uh, J. Butler Burke, who is a young physicist at the Cavendish Laboratory. Uh, he had just heard about radium, which had just been discovered a few years before, and he thought, well, the early Earth must have been much more intensely radioactive than the Earth today, so perhaps there's a way he could model the, the uh, state of the early Earth. And so by taking some beef soup, beef bullion, he put some radium into it and produced what he thought were these lifelike things that grew and subdivided over the space of about two weeks. They weren't quite bacteria, they decayed in sunlight, they were soluble in water, so it wasn't any kind of contamination that had happened. But he thought that these things that were half radium and half microbe, and he called them radiobes, could somehow be an indication of the origin of life on the early Earth. 
So the, the claim to produce life in the test tube is a claim that recurs, and it recurs because it is always deferred. It is always something that is about to happen but has not yet happened, because as soon as we do something that an earlier generation would have understood to be essentially the creation of life in the test tube, we realize how much further we have to go. When Francis Crick and James Watson discovered the structure of DNA in 1953, the construction plan of all living creatures on Earth was revealed. DNA is encoded with four bases, G, C, T, and A, assembled on a molecular backbone. It could be compared to the letters in a text, or the zeros and ones on a hard drive. They are linked together in an unimaginably long strain, and like blueprints, they describe every detail of an organism. By knowing what nature's blueprints look like, future genetic engineers could potentially do a better job at creation than natural selection has done in the past. If natural selection is considered as such an optimization technique, the only conclusion that one can uh, reach is that it is a very poor one. It is not um, a completely inefficient one, but it is it is, it, it is not an optimal one by far. And um, so if this is true, it means that other possibilities exist in the virtual world and that uh, nat natural processes will not generate them. So we are the only chance of the biological world to really make novelty. Creating new life? Nice idea, in theory. Practically, even simply manipulating genes in a deliberate way is very laborious. On the one hand, the amount of information is so vast that no one can get an overview of the meaning of every G, C, A, and T in our DNA. On the other hand, most of this information has no function at all. Millions and billions of DNA letters are just remnants of evolution, information litter, parts of viruses, and other useless stuff inherited from one generation to the next. Genes that fulfill certain functions are hiding in between. Because of this, it is very hard to find the useful genes, and even when they are found, it is hard to define their beginning and their end, to be able to extract and use them. As a consequence of this, traditional genetic engineering is one big game of trial and error. First, a familiar gene with a specific function has to be extracted. This part of DNA is then shot into the core of another cell, with the aim to reach its genome and paste itself into it. It is also necessary that the new piece of DNA is inserted in the right place in order to be able to fulfill its function. After hundreds and thousands of tries, it may work, and the modified DNA will behave in the expected way. Indeed, this is not a very efficient approach, but to this day, it is a common method in genetic engineering. If you think about normal engineering, right, building bridges, I once asked a bunch of engineers on this topic, I said, okay, and not synthetic biologists, but you know, normal engineers who build bridges and roads and things like that, I said, how many of you have ever designed something that didn't work the first time? Basically worked the first time. Maybe you had to tweak it a little bit, small changes, but it worked the first time. And in their entire career, you know, maybe a hundred years of professional engineering experience among all the people in the room, nobody had ever designed anything that didn't work the first time. In, I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and in the pharmaceutical industry, it's not uncommon for a research chemist to spend their entire career, 30 years, working and never develop a drug that works properly, not even once. And that's not because they're a bad chemist, it's because we're working with things that we really don't understand very much, but that are so important, things like medicine, that we're, it's worth spending the time and resources to get, to, to get through, and even though we don't understand things, we can sort of force fit things and make things together. Synthetic biology is the attempt to make out, remake biology out of things that we understand so that we can predict them and combine them and manipulate them in ways that are doable in the same ways that we do with bridges and roads and cars. Most people would argue that understanding every aspect of a genome or engineering a complete living organism deliberately is certainly impossible. But some might say it's just as impossible as flying seemed in the olden days. Like the engineers of the first airplanes, there are several concepts of how to apply engineering principles to biology. 
and of course a lot of ways to fail. One promising approach to synthetic biology is the idea of really understanding simple genomes, such as bacteria. The fewer the base pairs of such a genome, the bigger the chance of getting insight into the interaction between the genes. If one understands the way it works in detail, it is possible to modify the organism in a predictable way. For instance, to change its metabolism. Bacteria then can be deliberately modified into micro factories that produce useful drugs. Metabolic engineering is about uh, production of microorganisms or production of biological uh, entities that uh, will be able to uh, execute uh, reactions that a normally uh, biological natural system would, would not do. So for instance, there has been a, a success story uh, for, uh, in the, for synthetic biology in this field uh, has been the creation of, micro, of microbes, microorganisms, in particular yeasts, that can produce uh, um, artemisin. It's an anti-malarial drug that we know about because we've discovered it in a relatively rare plant that we know treats malaria very well, but we can't make it. We can only get it from these plants. And those plants aren't common, so it's very expensive. Most of the people who get malaria are poor, and so they can't get this drug. That's a big problem. Synthetic biologists, Jay Kiesling at Berkeley, are trying to design this, uh, using the same idea, sets of components, yeast that grows the same molecule. So that's just one molecule, but that's going to be the first application. Well, what this tells us is there are other molecules in the world that are difficult to create from cheap, simple ingredients that we can get anywhere. And usually we get those things from the natural world because biological systems, na nature, are really good at creating these complex molecules, much better than we are. And when we do it, we have to use high temperatures and high pressures and big industrial plants. Nature doesn't need any of that. It just needs a cell. Understanding complex DNA in a simple cell is just one approach to synthetic biology. Another concept suggests getting rid of unnecessary DNA in the genome. The idea of a minimal organism that has just enough DNA left to survive is the basis of a modular construction concept. Building blocks of DNA that are clearly defined and designed to fulfill certain tasks. These parts then are assembled to devices that can be inserted into a living organism. Minimizing the genome makes its behavior more predictable. Other genes with functional elements can be added without the risk of interference. This makes minimal organisms so important. They can be used as the perfect chassis for an engineered organism. By the way, engineering needs standards. In 1864, in the United States, there was not a uniform system for screw threads for nuts and bolts. What that means is machinists, they'd have their own shops, and they'd set the machines to make nuts and bolts however they liked. Right? So you could have your own standard, and hopefully your nuts and bolts would go together, otherwise you'd go out of business. But somebody else could have their own standard, different. Um, in April of 1864, in Philadelphia, a guy by the name of William Sellers presented a paper at a conference like this and said, hey, everybody, in the United States, set your machines to make nuts and bolts that are 60 degree angles squared off at the top. Oh, and then people went and did that over a period of time. And so now I get to go to the hardware store and get nuts and bolts, and when I buy them, they just go together. Um, so standards are incredibly important. They make the things that you're putting together more valuable. Uh, in synthetic biology, what are the standards that let us put parts together? Not nuts and bolts, but pieces of DNA that then function and do something. Each of those parts is well characterized and in a collection where you can just pull one off the shelf and you have a great deal of confidence in what it does. By making complex collections of parts, you can get new properties that you don't get for just one, doing one part at a time, such as safety, for example. You can make a car that goes very, very fast, uh, but to make one that actually you can steer and brake and has airbags to make a safe car requires very complex engineering, and so that's what we want to do with biology. If I were to ask you to build a car, how would you build a car? Would you create a standardized inventory of parts? determine what rules of assembly should be, and then build an assembly line? Or would you go to your garage, pull together the parts, and create something like a car on the one-up on a customized basis? OK, 
working. The reason why I talk about this is that if you talk about synthetic biology as distinct from recombinant DNA work of the conventional sense, the difference is that the easier way to do almost anything now is to do conventional recombinant DNA work. Over the long term, it may be easier to, again, build on the infrastructure and do things using the methods of synthetic biology. But right now, that's not so. That field, the engineers and the scientists that are in it, have a challenge. Because what they're trying to do is to build cars, all right, while also building registries of parts, inventories, rules of assembly and factories, all at the same time. And uh, that's a very, very difficult task. DNA parts not only have to be defined, they also have to be created. The so-called DNA synthesizer does this job. It produces artificial DNA sequences. You can think of it like an inkjet printer, like your, your common uh, printer that you can have in your home. It um, goes back and forth and spits four different colors of ink on it. Well, that's what we have is four different colors, which are ACGT, which go down and build up a stack. So when you print, you usually just have one layer, but we have hundreds of layers thick, which you can think of as growing up out of the sheet of paper, or in our case, it's a piece of glass. And that makes uh, DNA exactly where you want it to be in the, in the four colors in, in large piles. Um, so that's one way is the inkjet printer, and then at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you can take all those and put them into a test tube and then assemble them with enzymes. When we compare the synthesis of DNA with an inkjet printer, another question comes to mind. Why only use the colors C, G, A, and T to paint new life? Why only use four bases, not six? Or even 12? At present, scientists around the world are in the course of creating genome structures that have never existed before. In Leuven, Belgium, a group of scientists is in the process of leaving the paths life previously walked on Earth. They are trying to link the nucleotide acids to each other in a new way, to give the double helix structure a new backbone. By doing so, they create a life form that differs from anything nature has ever created before. Now we use the same letters, but what we, we change is the way the letters are linked to each other. Naturally evolved DNA links its G, C, A, and T bases on a backbone that is made out of phosphate and a certain kind of sugar, the so-called D-sugar molecule. There is no practical reason for base pairs to be linked in this way, as there are many other variations of sugar molecules that could do the same job. Replacing the backbone of naturally evolved old-school deoxyribonucleic acid and generating molecules like therose nucleic acid, TNA, hexatol nucleic acid, HNA, or glycol nucleic acid, GNA, would have no impact on the information. It would just lead to a different kind of genetic storage device. Naturally evolved organisms would be incompatible with organisms that carry their genetic information in a different way. This in fact makes synthetic organisms more safe because it can prevent genetic pollution to the environment. It's a safe way to make um, biological devices. Um, if you see that now you use genes as devices to make uh, engineering circuits, if you would do that with synthetic systems, you can combine what you want. It would never have any, um, any ethical or any, um, any, any dangerous aspect in that. I think it's creating um, a parallel world but based on the same principles as the natural system. Whether synthetic or not, DNA is just the software of a living organism. Without the hardware of a cell, life simply cannot occur. A living cell has to translate DNA letters into protein structures, the basic elements of every organic substance. It also has to be able to divide and reproduce itself. The artificial creation of such a self-replicant microbiological reading and writing device is challenging, but based on a simple idea. Fat does not mix with water. Similar to grease drops in a soup, fat proteins called liposomes can do the job and build a cell from scratch. Put in water, they go together and assemble themselves to bubble-like structures. Once a liposome bubble is created, it has similar properties to a cell. Pieces of RNA can be injected into it, 
producing more liposomes, which paste themselves into the cell wall. The bubble then grows to a certain point where it starts to divide. Cell division happens, the most fundamental function of life, a first step in synthesis, but not the goal. Unlike natural cells, these protocells are not able to pass over the entire RNA to the next generation. The genetic information gets thinner from division to division and makes synthetic cell structures unstable. <sighs> Nevertheless, the fundamental elements for building life from scratch already exist today. DNA circuits with clearly defined functions that can be assembled to so-called devices, synthetic DNA structures that make those devices safe, minimal organisms that make up their biological chassis, and protocells that could one day replace natural ones. This represents a breakthrough in human history, as for the first time, man is able to create real life out of dead matter. Besides its impact on religious beliefs, this scientific concept of intelligent design raises a lot of questions. For instance, what benefits can we expect from these artificially assembled creatures? Uh, you can use biology to make materials, physically construct stuff. So we're familiar with wood, right? So what happens when we get to program trees, right, to make different sorts of shapes? Biofuels, bacteria that make uh, fuels that are actually useful in existing engines. Spider silk. We know spider silk has amazing properties, right? Spider silk is stronger for, per its weight than steel is. This would be pretty useful in something like silk, right? But we can't get spider silk because only spiders can make it. Information processing. Computers process information. What if we could program bits of DNA and proteins to process information? It's all of these things that normally we can't create from scratch, that are expensive, that we have to derive from nature, that we have to go and cut down trees or m any sort, sort of number of things to get at. Suddenly we can make those things from basic elements, things that are cheap and available. These people in Cambodia could become some of the first beneficiaries of synthetic biology. A problem in nearly every post-war country are the remnants of war. In particular, landmines and dangerous chemical compounds are now a serious threat to children in the regions. Cleaning such sites is dangerous, expensive, and mostly not affordable for these countries. Victor De Lorenzo from the Center of Natural Biotechnology in Madrid works on a solution for such problems. His work is dedicated to designing bacteria that are able to detect dangerous pollutants and even clean up polluted sites. In year 98, uh, there was a major uh, spill of uh, heavy metals as a consequence of an accident that happened in southern Spain and uh, that released um, a, a mineral called parit uh, that is very rich in cadmium, a uh, heavy metal, and contaminated a vast uh, agricultural area. So during that period of time, uh, we were asked by uh, our government to uh, really come up with some possibilities of remediation. So uh, different people um, um, thought on different um, possibilities and our own contribution to this uh, issue uh, was to um, produce bacteria with an ability to hyper accumulate heavy metals on its biomass. And this bacteria uh, happened to be also soil bacteria namely um, of a species called Rastonia, whatever name, and then uh, these bacteria were inoculated in soil polluted with metals, and what we could observe is that through this accumulation, the recovery of the vegetal cover of the site uh, was much um, uh, improved in, to, to some extent. So uh, this was a case in which we could really prove that the use of genetically engineered microbes for environmental applications did have an effect and did make a difference in a scenario of actual uh, pollution by heavy metals. Synthetic biology aims to make bioengineering easier and cheaper. Similarly to computers, where mainframes were replaced by desktop systems, it has the potential to become a cheap and highly available technique for third world countries as well as students around the globe. The knowledge and its applications flow to a much broader array of individuals and groups and organizations it flows from advanced industrial countries to developing countries more rapidly than has been true in the past. If you look at the iGEM competition, the parts competition that you've heard about, I was actually rather surprised when countries without significant presence in the area were able to field teams that were winning. 
iGEM is the Olympic Games for future synthetic biologists. Students from all over the world gather every year to present their biological engineering projects. The team I know best from MIT last year decided they didn't like how E. coli, the bacteria that lives in your gut, how it smells. It's kind of stinky. So they decided to reprogram the scent or bouquet of E. coli. They did this by adding in eight different genes from different organisms into E. coli and then integrating those genes with a control system that regulated when they turned on and off. And as a result, they have a new strain of E. coli that while the E. coli is growing and dividing, um, the cells produce a smell that's wintergreen or mint. As a side effect of the students' work, more and more standardized genes with specified functions are extracted from living organisms. These gene sequences are freely available for anyone to view online. This gives other researchers the opportunity to reassemble them again within their projects and for their efforts. By doing this, iGEM not only creates new applications, but also helps science go the distance to establish a library of ready-to-use biological parts, beyond commercial research. With every biobrick that is added to this open source library, another biological function is freely available and can no longer be patented for private profit. A specific issue that exists today that I wonder about is in the United States, for example, there's no public investment of any significance in DNA synthesis technology. All of the investment's private. I benefit from that investment, both as a consumer of the technology and also as a founder of one of the companies. Um, but it's not the case that uh, I'm comfortable with the idea that a technology as powerful as DNA synthesis is only being driven forward by the private sector. It's a technology that impacts the public. A lot of people in synthetic biology have companies. A lot of people seem to want to make money off of it. I think that's OK. Um, the best way to develop this technology is to give people the chance to make money off of it. Any powerful technology coming in to society, if it's being owned and patented and, and controlled by a small group of industrialists, um, becomes, becomes a monopoly. And uh, that's what we're going to see, these monopolies, these new monopolies emerging, uh, which, which shut out the interests of all those or others, apart from those who control and own the technology. And we've already seen some really key patents uh, in this field, whether it's on the parts of life or on, on synthetic organisms beginning to be applied for. Well, one world you could live in would be you have a thousand parts and there's a thousand different people each owning a different part. And so you'd have to go talk to them all and get their permission, get a license and figure it out. It's very expensive to do that. And nobody really can afford to do it unless you happen to be unbelievably wealthy. Um, I'd like to live in a different world. Um, at the moment, those who stand to benefit, the, the scientists, their investors, um, and, and new startup companies are really the only ones having a discussion. And to a certain extent, telling others to keep away that they don't want regulation, they want to be voluntary in this. Um, that's not acceptable. I'd like to live in a world where the basic biological parts, which encode useful genetic functions, turn on or off gene expression, make a chemical that smells like banana, um, swim, don't swim, uh, that all of these basic functions are freely available so that everybody, right, not just a big company, not just an individual, everybody can build genetic systems in the future, right? This shouldn't be something that's owned by any one person. Synthetic biology is a shared technology making each of us a genetic garage engineer? A vision that is not shared by every scientist as a positive scenario for the future. Sharing the capability to create new life forms from scratch with a wide range of people may one day reveal itself as a great threat to our personal safety, as well as our general security. Is it possible that sometime in the relatively near future, these um, capabilities in synthetic biology, the technologies, the knowledge, the material, will spread very widely uh, and will become so simple that lots of people outside of the professional field will be able to use them. That seems to me to be a strong possibility. Ebola, right, as a genome, is under 20,000 base pairs long. 
Any one of us could go get the sequence for Ebola from the internet. We could pay to synthesize it. It would cost $20,000, right? That's today. The cost of doing that is dropping by a factor of two every 18 months, maybe even faster. Um, so in 10 years, the cost of doing that is going to be quite cheap. Uh, some people would argue that we shouldn't worry about that, that the best thing we can do is to spread this capability as widely as possible and then in some way, which I don't quite understand, all will be made safe. To my mind, that's exactly the wrong way to go and what we have to do is to think very carefully what we need to constrain, why we need to constrain it and how we need to constrain it. If, if something looks funny, if somebody seems to be doing experiments, you don't quite understand why, and you learn a little bit about it, and you think, that doesn't sound very healthy, then you go and tell somebody. And so the idea is that we have a consciousness that's growing, that we must be responsible to catch anything that might be mis misused early on. Preventing script kiddies from playing with the wrong toys is one thing, but there are also other players in the game players that have the money and the capability to create harmful devices. Well, if you look at the history, the history is very clear that there has been very, very few instances of bioterrorism. But there have been state program after state program in major countries on a large scale and use of uh, biological weapons on a relatively large scale against animals, humans, and plants. Well, the skills that get developed in these state bioweapons programs and the abilities, they leak out. They can't be contained, right? Science is like that. And maybe even they'll leak out with the case of a state giving capacities, or maybe they'll leak out because somebody who has the skills will go rogue, or maybe they'll just diffuse in the air. You know, the, the, these things spread very easily. So. We, if you can get control of the state programs, you can damp down on this threat a lot. The weakest of the conventions we've got to deal with proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. It doesn't have a major organization to look after it, and it doesn't have any effective means of verifying that the state parties are living up to their obligations. There is no need for hostile intentions to cause serious harm. Unlike in the United States, where terrorists and so-called countries of concern are seen as a threat, Europeans are more afraid of disasters that occur accidentally, a concern that is not shared within the scientific community. The problem is not so much that when you put a new bacterium in a site, then this, bac this bacteria will start taking over all the existing uh, biological community there, but just the contrary. The very problem is to have the new bacteria uh, being inserted, being colonizing the site that is the subject of our action. So I don't see that at a, as, as a problem. I see that as a challenge, precisely. Well, one of the good things of, of using this engineering is that you, you tend to know what you're doing, what, how you build, how you build your, your uh, applications. So it means that you can actually design. So it's not trial and error. The problem often is of doing trial and error is, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's change here and see what happens. And then this is good because you learn, but often it can lead to, or sometimes can lead to, uh, to, uh, to unexpected results. But see if you know how you're actually going to proceed, then you have a good knowledge of it. So in itself, it already minimizes the risk. Biological technologies are frightening to people because, of course, uh, the idea that something you can't see can kill you and so on is very, very, gets us at a deep level. On the other hand, we would not want to go back to the, the pre-microbiology era of the mid-19th century when people died of infections almost every time, uh, or a certain percentage of the time they had any surgery and so on and so forth. We, we need the scientific advances and the, the benefits, certainly, if things go the way we expect, will far outweigh the risks. But the risks are not zero. The biggest short-term risk in synthetic biology is that the technology won't happen. The biggest short-term risk is that people stop it, that people get scared by this idea of us creating life, though we really can't do that yet, but creating parts of life from scratch. That's the biggest risk because this is way too valuable and way, the potential is way too great for us to take that chance. That's the greatest danger that you could face. Beyond the risks, there are the opportunities. Beyond the opportunities, there are the people who will live with the outcomes of synthetic biology. 
New products and new manufacturing techniques, synthetic biology will change our way of life, our jobs, and our economy. But how and who will benefit from it? The, the, the ability to predict the future of a technology, we, we conclude, looking at a bunch of cases, is very, very limited. So the first word out of our mouth is usually uncertainty. So there is a great deal of uncertainty about what will happen as a result of synthetic biology. Uh, if you had asked somebody um, who for the first time connects computers, uh, what would be his vision uh, about um, this activity of connecting computers like 10 years from then? And I think he wouldn't be, have been able to give a good answer. In particular, he would not have realized that the internet was uh, coming out of this at some point in the future. And to me, it's a little bit like, like this. Um, the, the possibilities seem tremendous. Uh, we're surrounded by living systems. Uh, we use living systems every day. Um, to be able to um, do this with, um, with a certain degree of rationality and a certain degree of success, I guess would uh, open up tremendous possibilities. And I could imagine they would go far beyond what we do today in sense of uh, chemicals, energy, pharmaceutical products. Besides hopes, fears and interests, in the long run, synthetic biology will be seen as part of one big development mankind has been going through for thousands of years. Historians will someday tell the story of the days when people began creating life from scratch. It is in our hands whether this story will be a tragedy or a shining story of success.